Thank you for your spirit. And Lord, as we turn our attention now to uh, the Philippian letter that Paul wrote and to some very practical things that uh, he teaches us here, I pray that you would give us hearts and minds that can understand and wills that are determined to obey. And Holy Spirit, we ask you to teach us, to instruct us, and to enlighten us, and to help us as we spend this time together looking into your word, to be strengthened in our faith and encouraged thereby. So uh, come Holy Spirit, be our teacher, and uh, speak to us now. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the story is told of a, a pilot who uh, always looked down over this one valley that he always flew over, just looked very intently. And uh, one day his co-pilot asked him, so why do you always look so carefully when we fly over this particular valley? What's so interesting about that spot? And the pilot replied, he said, you know, see that stream down there? Well, when I was a kid, I used to sit down there fishing and I'd look up and see the planes going by and wish that I could be a pilot. Well, now I'm a pilot and I look down at that stream and I wish I could be down there fishing. <laughs> In our daily bread, uh, Philip Parnham tells the story of a rich industrialist who was on a holiday and uh, down in probably in the Caribbean, I'm guessing. But he's walking down the beach and he sees this fisherman just sitting there just lazily beside his boat, you know, just taking her easy. And he comes up to the guy and he says, well, why aren't you out there fishing? And the fisherman replied, well, I've, I've caught enough fish for today. That's all I need. And the industrialist says, well, you know, why don't you catch more fish? Well, what would I do with more fish? Well, you could sell them. Then you'd have money. Well, why would I want money? Well, then you could buy a better boat and then you could catch more fish and then you could get more money and you could purchase nylon nets and, you know, you make more money, soon you'd have a fleet of boats and you'd be rich like me. And the fisherman said, well, well, then what would I do? And the rich guy said, well, then you could sit around and take it easy. <laughs> and the fisherman says, well, I'm already doing that. <laughs> you know? We've all heard that saying that, you know, the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. Problem is, when you get to the other side of the fence, it's greener on the other side of the fence, right? That's kind of how that works. Well, ever since the Garden of Eden, humankind has, you know, had a propensity to want what it doesn't have. That's kind of one of the original sins, right? We want something we're not supposed to have or can't have, and you know, contentment just doesn't come easily or naturally to most of us and probably, truth be told, not to any of us. Contentment is something that we must learn if we're going to consistently experience it in our lives. Well, one of the uh, things that marked the Apostle Paul's life was that he was thankful. Time and again, as you read through his letters and you read what he's saying and he says, I give thanks or thanks be to God or some phrase like that. And, and just a few verses earlier here in Philippians chapter 4, where we're going to be looking at this morning, he, he's told us that prayers that are accompanied with thanksgiving actually result in us having peace in our hearts and in our minds. Now, immediately following that instruction about prayer and, and making our prayers with thanksgiving, he, he enters into another bit of instruction where he talks about contentment. And that's what we're going to think about this morning. Philippians chapter 4, uh, starting to read at verse 10. Here's what he says. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. 
I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction, and you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel, after I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now to God, to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So Paul is telling us that contentment is something that we can learn. Verse 11, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Now what exactly was it that Paul had learned which enabled him to live contentedly in the midst of adverse circumstances, because if you remember, he's actually writing this letter while he's in a prison cell and uh, possibly chained to the wall, um, chained to a guard next to him who's with him all the time, 24-7, another guard outside the door. I mean, it's, it's not a comfortable place to be. So um, what exactly had he learned which enabled him to live contentedly in those kinds of circumstances? Well, I think it'll be helpful, helpful for us to understand the, the, the particular word Paul uses here, the Greek word, which is translated as learn. It's not referring to some you know, formal piece of instruction, like you know, Paul went to synagogue school and he took contentment 101 and he passed the course and now he's a contented person. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that, that's not what it's referring to. What it's referring to is learning through experience and practice. Yes, there's a, an internal intellectual um, aspect to this, but it's, it's always something which is worked out externally and practically in a person's life. So you, you intake some knowledge, but then you apply it to life. That's what he's talking about here. Experiential, practical knowledge. It'd be like, you know, you want to learn how to ride a horse. So you, you get a bunch of books on horses and on saddles and on riding and you read all these books and you go there and now I know how to ride a horse. Ha uh-huh. <laughs> ha. Some of you have ridden horses I hope. That's not how you learn to ride a horse. I mean it could be helpful to have that internal intellectual information but the way to ride a horse is to actually go up to the barn and take the horse out of the stall and then time to the railing while you saddle them up if you want and once you got the saddle on and everything's nice and tight, then you get onto the saddle and you start riding. Well, unhook it first, right, from the fence. <laughs> but then you get on the horse and you actually start learning how to ride by actually doing it. And that's the kind of knowledge Paul's talking about here, learning to be content. It's not something you take a course in school, but it's actually you learn how to do it by practicing it. When Paul says he's learned to be content, he's not saying that he he took a course somewhere, but he's saying that in the nitty-gritty messiness of life, he has learned through experience, practical application of what he's known to be true, he has learned to be content. Ellie Maxwell, the founder of Prairie Bible College, used to say the school of obedience is one where you get the test first and the lesson later. That's different from how our schools do it. They give you the lessons first and then the test at the end to see if you actually, you know, assimilated anything into your thinking. But Maxwell says the school of obedience is when you get the test first and the lesson later. In other words, we don't get advance warning as to when those tests are going to come, but come they will, and when they come, the test will reveal whether or not we've mastered the material and, and we'll find out whether or not we actually have got it, whatever it is that God's trying to teach us. So the test comes along to reveal to us what we don't yet know so that we can start to learn it and put it into practice in our lives. And when Paul says that he has learned to be content, he's saying that being content 
As he's writing this, being content is experientially true in his life. And if you know Paul's story at all, you know that he had many, many occasions to test this claim. You know, whether it's when he's, um, well, he gave up five years of his life to be in jail, <laughs> when he could have been out free man if he would have paid a bribe or whatever. Um, the times when he was sailing in a boat and it sank, it seems like most of the time when he sailed in a boat it would sink. Um, he could have been very discontent. But he had learned to be content. It was experientially true in his life. And his conclusion, based on his life experience, was that I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. Whether my boat is sinking, or whether I'm going hungry, or whether I get beat up by people in the city because they don't like what I'm telling them, or whatever it is, he says, I have learned to be content in all the circumstances of my life, whether they be good, bad, or ugly. Well, I think Paul had learned to be content because he had been convinced, he had become convinced that there were some things which were absolutely true all the time for everyone, anywhere. And it was because of these foundational and absolute truths that he actually could be content no matter what came his way. He had a lens, you might say, that he could look through life and say, you know what? Here's what's real, here's what's not real. Here's what I need to know to help me to think rightly. Well, the question is then, what did Paul know with such certainty that he could be content no matter what happened in his life? What were the, the theological anchors, if you wish, which he knew would never fail him, would never let him down? Well, there's a couple things I think that we notice in this passage which were like that for Paul. They were just the ultimate realities that he goes, yep, that defines my life. This is what I know for sure. Therefore, I can live a contented life. The first one was this. God is our strength. God is our strength. Notice Paul says, verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, was he saying that he could run, you know, uh, 30 miles in uh, an hour? <laughs> or was he saying, you know, I can uh, pull a sinking ship out of the water and onto dry land? Or, you know, when he says, I, I can do all things, what's he referring to? Some physical act of heroism or something like that? Or was he saying that he had tapped into a reservoir of power such that he could deal with anything that came his way in life? Was he saying... I can do all things. Whatever it is God allows into my life, I can deal with it, I can handle it, I can engage whatever, because God is with me. Well, I think that's what he was saying. Paul had grasped something that all of God's people must sooner or later come to realize, and that is that God is my strength. God is my strength. God is the one who sustains me. God is the one who empowers me. When he gives me a job to do, he also gives me all I need to do it. It is God and God alone who gives me my life, who gives me the power to live each day. God is my strength. And this is a message that actually goes right through the Bible. Back in Exodus, um, this is the testimony of Moses. He says, the Lord is my strength. And that's what David proclaimed in the Psalms. Psalm 29, for example, the Lord will give strength to his people. Or Psalm 43, thou art the God of my strength. And Isaiah said, he declared, the Lord God is my strength and my song. And Habakkuk, a little while later, says that this is true. The Lord God is my strength. So, so Paul wasn't inventing a new idea. He wasn't coming up with something that people hadn't realized before. He was simply saying that the, what the people of God have always come to realize, and, and thus he know exactly, he knew exactly this, that he could do all things. He could do all things, including being content in every situation and in every circumstance, come what may. Because God was his strength, he could have the right attitude, the right posture, the right response to his circumstances, and he could experience that contentment because God was his strength. Paul had learned, as he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that God's power is made perfect in weakness. He had learned that it is into weakness 
that God pours his grace and pours his strength and his power in limitless measure. And this was so true that Paul was even willing to boast in his weakness so that the power of Christ might dwell in him. He he was glad to say, you know what, I am weak. I don't want up to it. But watch what God will do through me because I've surrendered to him. And I'm allowing him to live through me and empower me. Now, I think uh, we all understand that this is not how the world around us functions, this, you know, glorying in our weakness. That's, (laughs) That's not the way our world works. Weakness is not a desirable state in our culture. And as a rule, we we do everything in our power to be in a position of strength and power and self-sufficiency and autonomy. We don't want to be weak. And as I read our culture, maybe I'm wrong, but as I read our culture, you know, being weak is not a desirable thing. And we tend to look down on people who give up these things and allow themselves to become dependent on others for their needs. This is a culture, and this is our culture's frame of reference. And uh, our culture's theological anchors, if you will, are personal autonomy. In other words, I can do it myself and you can't touch me. It's, I'm a unit all by myself. I don't need anyone else. Self-sufficiency and independence. Those are our our culture's theological anchors. But a fundamental principle of the Christian life is that God doesn't expect or require or allow us to live the Christian life in our own strength. Our culture says, do it yourself. Do it yourself. You got all you need to do whatever you want to do. And God says, no, no, that's contrary to what I'm saying. God's saying, uh, I don't expect you or require you, or indeed, am I going to allow you to live the Christian life in your own strength? You can't do it. It's impossible, absolutely impossible to live the Christian life apart from the power of Christ's resurrected life in us. Now, we can wear labels and do all kinds of religious activity, but unless Christ lives in us, we actually aren't Christians. We aren't, we don't belong to him. It's Christ in us which is the hope of glory. It's Christ in us which gives us spiritual life. And it's exactly this point where I think a lot of us as Christians struggle, especially in our culture where we are told to be self-sufficient and autonomous and in control and all those sorts of things. It's exactly this point where so many of us struggle. God is working in us to produce and to cultivate a dependence upon him And very often, we are working as hard as we can to live the Christian life in our own strength and power. Do you see the dynamic that's going on here? God's trying to, in a sense, undermine our self-sufficiency, trying to help us quit being that way. And we're working so hard to hard. We're going to, we're going to master, we're going to do this, right? I got a question. So in a contest between God and you, who do you think is going to win? Yeah? Of course, the Lord, like he's, gonna, he's, he's not going to be stymied by our unwillingness to be weak, if you wish, or to let him be in control of our lives. And one of the reasons that the tests come in our lives is to wean us off of the bottle of self-dependence and self-sufficiency and to teach us to let God be our strength. It's a hard lesson to learn. And I don't think we probably ever get it completely learned, all the life we live here. Get to heaven, maybe, then we'll have it all figured out because we'll be perfect. But in this life, we're going to struggle with this because partly our culture, our world, our society tells us, and, and really this is the mindset of the world, you can do it yourself. You can do it yourself. The myth of the self-made person. And God is saying, no, you are actually dependent and you need me. And apart from me, You can do nothing. That's what Jesus said. And so it's the same way with contentment. We never learn the lesson of contentment, such as Paul is talking about, by seeking to stir it up within ourselves. Only as we admit our lack to our Heavenly Father will we find his strength to be all he asks of us and to do all that he asks of us. As long as we're trying to, you know, we're, I'm going to be content. I'm going to be content today. You know, you ever do that? 
I am going to be content today. How long does it last? Well, I gather by some of the chuckles that you, you understand what I'm saying. It doesn't last very long. Because in and, our, in and of ourselves, we haven't got what it takes. Something that Amy Carmichael said uh, is pertinent here. She was a, a missionary in India for years. She said, she said, in acceptance lies peace. In acceptance lies peace. So when we say, okay, Lord, I accept what you're allowing today. That's when the peace comes. And quite frankly, that's when the contentment begins. Because we recognize God is in control of my life. I can trust him. It's when we understand that the sovereign God has ordered the details of our lives. And he does what he does with love for us, with our best in mind. And when we submit to him, we surrender to him, we accept all that he and his infinite love and wisdom has permitted, it's then that his peace permeates our being. And we find rest for our souls. And lo and behold, we find that we are content. And though we must endure circumstances, even though we must endure them, we may not, that we may not like or prefer, we can still have a contentment in the midst of them. Paul doesn't say, um, let's go back to that verse there. He doesn't say, um, I've learned to be content for all the circumstances. He says, I've, been, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I have. Do you see the difference? It's kind of like, um, you know, when something happens, I mean, there's bad things happen to us. Okay, that's, we are in a fallen world. Bad things happen to us. We don't have to say, oh, you know, that's so good, that bad thing. No, no, bad is evil is evil. It's wrong. But in the middle of that, we can still have contentment or peace in our hearts. The circumstances don't have to dictate what's going on in our heart. Though the temptation is there for us to allow that to happen, but what God can give us is what we need in the middle of our circumstances to experience his peace and his contentment even when life stinks, okay? And Paul had learned contentment in the middle of very difficult circumstances. He says, I've learned to be content. He had learned it by practicing it in the midst of, his, uh, of life's vicissitudes. He had learned that if his heart was fixed and focused on the master, he could be content in every situation. And that's why Paul was continually bubbling over with joy. This epistle especially is known as the epistle of joy. Something like 20 times he talks about being joyful or being glad. That's why he could continually bubble over with joy and thanksgiving regardless of what was happening in his life. Didn't matter if he was in jail. Didn't matter if he was in the inner prison with his legs in a stock and his arms attached to the wall. Wherever he was, he could be content, not because of his circumstances, but because in the middle of his circumstances, God would give him what he needed to have peace and to be, be content. He had learned that God in me is my strength and therefore I can be content. So Paul had two theological anchors which governed his life. The first one is God is our strength. God is all that we need. Um, he gives me all that I need to deal with whatever comes my way. But then the second uh, theological anchor, we call it that, is found in verse 19. God will supply all our needs. God will supply all our needs. When it, what it came down to is that for Paul, God in his situation was his supply. My God, he said, shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now there's a stream of teaching in the church today that tells us that we can demand God to give us whatever we want or whatever we in so-called faith claim is our right as sons and daughters of God. And uh, they use this verse as kind of their proof text or their justification for such thinking. My God shall supply all of my need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. 
But notice what it says. It doesn't say, my God shall supply all your wants. It says, my God shall supply all your needs. And, and notice as well, from the context, that God's supply doesn't look the same in every situation. Uh, it's not like there's a divine formula and we just punch in the variables into the formula and we get a standardized answer every time. Look at how God answered Paul's needs. Um, he didn't do it the same way all the time. God's supply for Paul meant that sometimes, and verse 12 shows us this, sometimes he got to get along with humble means. Other times he got to experience what it is to live in prosperity. Other times God's provision included going hungry. And sometime else it'd be being filled. See, whatever what Paul had learned is that whatever God allows to come my way, that's his provision for me. And the provision might one time be, yes, I'm going hungry, I'm getting wet, floating in the ocean for three days, you know. Another time, God's provision was he got to live in a nice place and get fed well. <laughs> Both were God's provision. And the point is that we can trust God to supply what is needed in each situation. And in each situation, we can be absolutely sure that he can and he will meet our needs as he sees fit. And we can rest in his care and we can be content in his provision for us, whatever that provision might happen to be. The question comes down to this. Can we and will we trust God to look after us and provide for us what we need? Will we and can we trust him? Will we look to him and believe that he has our best in heart? Are we really willing to have that kind of trust in him? This is the place that Paul had come to, and in accepting what God had allowed in his life, he had come to experience the freedom that comes from letting go of one's expectations in regards to God's provision for us. And I know I've got myself in so much trouble sometimes because I'm going, yes, God, I want you to provide for me, and here's how I want you to provide for me. And then God didn't provide how I thought he should. And then I'm going, well, what are you there for? I won't ask you to put up your hands if you've ever thought that way. But sometimes we want to dictate how God should provide for us, and he's not open to our dictation. God provides for us, and Paul had learned that. And instead of um, instead of having wrong expectations, he let go of his expectations in regards to God's provision. And instead of and and and, and instead of uh, complaining, he received with gratitude what God had allowed, and thereby he found that elusive thing that we call contentment. It really all hinged on Paul submitting to God and submitting to God's ways in his life. And, and so it has to be for us. How do we experience contentment? How do we get that peace in our hearts? By telling God, here's my expectations, you better meet them, or by saying, God, I don't know what you have in store for me, but I trust you, and I believe you will give me all that I need. So Paul is convinced that God could be absolutely trusted to completely look after him in each and every situation, and what was true for Paul's life is no less true for us today. I had the privilege of kind of sitting, having a ringside seat, sitting on the sidelines as it were, but I had a ringside seat as I, I watched this happen in the lives of my parents. And I have to tell you, it's been one of the, the biggest lessons in my life, watching what God did for them. Through a series of uh, difficult circumstances, my, my parents left their, their last uh, pastorate when my dad turned 65, and uh, they had nowhere to go. And they were not very well off financially, and it was just a very hard, dark time for them. And I'm sure they sometimes wondered what God was up to. I wondered. And uh, I know my dad was very discouraged and I think even depressed the first year after that happened. But I watched as God provided for every need that they had. He took them to a place where they were able to continue serving 
the Lord together. And uh, one of the blessings of the, the new job they had with, uh, with Prairie, actually, was they got to travel together representing the school all over Alberta and Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and then down through five of the states down to, was it Mississippi, I think, how far the south they got. But they got to travel together and do ministry together and meet Christians from all over the place that really, really loved Jesus. It was an amazing experience for them. So he took them to a place where they were able to continue serving the Lord. He took them to a place where they were able to plug into a Christian community of believers and and uh, receive solid biblical teaching week after week and be nourished and encouraged and, and have fellowship with other believers of like mind. He, he, he gave them a place where they could make some true and loyal Christian friendships that lasted for the rest of their lives. It was amazing how God provided for them. And by the time my, my father died, seven years after they moved to Three Hills, they owned the first home they'd ever owned in their life. And they had received a multitude of other blessings from the good hand of God. And as a, as a young man watching that, I, I just was incredibly amazed at how God looked after them and provided for every need. God's provision for my parents was a full-orbed provision. He didn't merely supply their material needs, but he looked after their spiritual needs, their emotional needs, their relational needs, and and uh, all the needs in their lives that they had, God provided for them. They experienced what Paul experienced. And they found contentment in God and his provision for them. And it was it really was a lesson for me, an example for me, which I'll never forget. In fact, it's shaped my life. This is the God we serve. He is faithful. He is so faithful. He looks after us as we yield to him. Apostle Paul says, my God shall supply all your needs. My God shall supply all your needs. Psalm 84, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Amen and amen. It's so true. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, Jesus says, and his righteousness and all these things, that is the things you have need of, will be added to you. Somebody used to say, God is no man's debtor. He will never owe us a thing. He pays out his accounts in full. And he will do the same for us. You know, sometimes we may be tempted to think that contentment will come. We might be tempted to think that contentment will come when we see every need met and every desire realized. Then we'll be content. The truth is, that contentment will be ours when we become convinced that our security is in God and we can trust him to meet every need. It's a different way of thinking, but it's the way God wants us to think, that our trust and our security is in him, not in our abilities, not in our desires, not even in our agenda. God is our strength and God will supply all our needs. These two truths govern Paul's life and they can and they must be anchors in our lives as well. God is my strength. God will supply all of my needs. Maybe not how I think they should be supplied, but he will care for me and look after me. He will be faithful. And we can choose to be content because of who God is and not because of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Paul says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that now at last you have received, re revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can be content in any circumstance if God is strengthening me. Nevertheless, you've done well to share with me in my affliction. And you yourselves know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. 
For even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I've received everything in full and have an abundance. I'm amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul. And Lord, we know as we even just read his letters and and read the book of Acts that life was not a cakewalk for him. It was difficult. He had lots of troubles, lots of trials, lots of difficulties. Um, So many reasons, humanly speaking, to be disappointed and depressed and and, uh, discontented. And yet, in the middle of all the adverse circumstances, he could say, I have learned to be content. My God will supply my needs. Lord, I pray that you would help us, like the Apostle Paul, to have a very great God confidence. To be sure that you will look after us and we can trust you implicitly. We can trust you to care for us, to provide for us, to look after us as we put our hope and our trust in you. Lord, forgive us for the times we want to be autonomous. We want to go our own way and do our own thing. And, and, uh, and then sometimes it's only when we get into trouble that we think, oh, maybe God should be helping me here. Lord, help us on the front end to say, no, I'm going to live my life in such a way that my confidence is in the Lord. It's not in my abilities. It's not in my portfolios and my investments and our medical system. It's not, that's not my confidence. My confidence is in the Lord. And Father, that we would develop a healthy God dependence as your people, as a congregation in our personal lives a healthy dependence on you. And then watch as you do amazing things in our lives to meet our needs, to fulfill us, to grant us that peace we so desire, the contentment which comes when we can rest in you. So Lord, uh, help us understand this. Help us to put into practice. We need you to help us with that. And so we thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.